Welcome everyone to the Aviation Development Program. Please be aware that your mics and cameras are disabled by default. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending and I will now hand it over to our facilitator, Sadie Perez. Thank you so much. We're coming to you today live via Zoom and on the FAA's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter live streams. For any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. Again, thank you for joining us today to learn about the Federal Aviation Administration, Administration's Aviation Development Program, or what we find fondly call ADP. My name is Sadie Perez. I will be your host for today's session, and I would just like to take a few words to tell you about myself. I started my career with the FAA in 1992 while I was in college as a cooperative education student in Fort Worth, Texas. Throughout my 28 years with the FAA, I have held numerous positions throughout my career. And I will be the first to tell you it's a great agency to work for. Today, I currently manage the National Outreach Team for Diversity and Inclusion within the FAA's Office of Civil Rights. And as part of my uh, professional portfolio, I co-lead and maintain the day-to-day -day management of the Aviation Development National Task Force which you will hear from throughout today's session. Now, I'd like to take a few mo take a moment to introduce a few of some key official executives here at FAA who are champions to the aviation development program. But without them, this unique program that we will share with you today would not have been possible. And I'll start with my boss, Mr. Courtney Wilkerson, who serves as the Federal Aviation Administration Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Office of Civil Rights. He assists the agency in creating and ensuring a healthy work environment that supports and encourages contributions from a multifaceted employee base and utilizes many avenues to eradicate discrimination, both for the FAA's current and future workforce. Mr. Wilkinson could not be with us today but did send a video to share a few words with you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are in this world. Hello and welcome on behalf of the Federal Aviation Administration. My name is Courtney Wilkerson and I am the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Civil Rights. The FAA is committed to building a diverse and inclusive workforce, which we believe fosters safer and more secure skies. As the FAA, we constantly search for innovative ways to better reflect the multiplicity of the American people we serve. The Aviation Development Program is one such effort, and I'm particularly proud of it because I helped get it off the ground at its inception in 2018. Today, the ADP provides qualified Americans with targeted disabilities the opportunity to pursue a career in aviation and enhance the FAA's talent pool. I hope you find today's information session useful, and I wish you success in your entire career development. Thanks and good luck. We're all rooting for you. Now, I will I would like to introduce Mr. Brian Throop, Deputy Vice President for the FAA's Air Traffic Services. Mr. Throop joined the FAA in 1984 as an air traffic controller in Dallas, Texas. He has since served in a number of staff supervisory and director positions throughout the nation and internationally. Mr. Throop was appointed to the executive service in October, 2017 and is currently the Deputy Vice President for Air Traffic Services. In this important role, Mr. Throop is responsible for advising, assisting with executive director, direction, planning, management, implementation, oversight, and continuous monitoring of air traffic services operations nationally. I would like to now hand it over to Mr. Brain Throop. Thank you, Sadie, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to participate in today's event. My name is Brian Troop, and I've been with the FAA since 1984, starting out as an air traffic controller in Texas. 
Our new aviation development program is an avenue through which you too may qualify to enter an exciting civilian aviation career. The FAA is a wonderful place to work with literally hundreds of ways to grow your career. Now I've been afforded the opportunity to fill all kinds of professional positions from working as the air traffic representative to the International Civil Aviation Organization in Latin America, to representing the FAA at NORAD's Western Air Defense Sector near Seattle, Washington, right after the attacks of September 11, 2001. I also spent several years running the FAA Special Operations Security Directorate, which is a national program that oversees the FAA's operational relationship with federal, state, and local law enforcement, the United States military, and a variety of national security agencies. And most recently, I had the privilege of becoming the Deputy Vice President for Air Traffic Services, where I help oversee the daily operation of our nation's air traffic control system. Now, I hope this inspires you to consider the FAA's Aviation Development Program as an entry-level way to your own amazing aviation career. So thank you and best of luck to you all. Thank you, Brian. Um, and what an impressive resume. And just, you know, officially to thank you in front of the public for all your support that you give to this aviation development program. We're truly excited for the future of the candidates coming in. At this time, I would like to introduce our last key executive, but certainly not least, Mr. Glenn Martin. Mr. Martin began his career with the FAA as an air traffic controller in 1988 and served in several positions within the agency and throughout the nation. To acknowledge just a few of his key positions, Mr. Martin served as the FAA's Vice President of Air Traffic Services. And while in this position, he was responsible for providing executive direction and high level leadership to large complex organizations assigned responsibility for delivering air traffic services to the nation. Mr. Martin's currently the Vice President of Safety and Technical Training Organization within the Air Traffic Organization, or what we fondly, fondly like to call the ATO. In his current role, he provides full executive direction as the focal point for safety and quality assurance for this air traffic safety management, safety management system, excuse me, and quality control of all of ATO's direct mission, support, and technical training. At this time, I would like to present to you, Mr. Glenn Martin. Thank you very much, Sadie, and welcome everyone from uh, wherever you're at, and uh, hope that you're having a good day and very excited for you to be here. Uh, as Sadie pointed out, uh, I started off in a very small tower back in Kansas City few decades ago as an air traffic controller and um, you know it and then it got a lot of opportunity in the FAA and I think that's what I want to impress upon you. Uh, the FAA does a lot of great things. It has a very focused safety mission, but it also has a lot of um, opportunity to be in either quality assurance or a great trainer or some of the international work that Brian had pointed out. The opportunities abound and we are always looking for dedicated and excited people that want to come in, innovate the things that we do and make a difference each day that they're at work. So I'd like to thank you all for taking the opportunity to listen to our aviation development program. Uh, I can assure you that if you take advantage of it and uh, are able to get excited about the job and show some aptitude for it. There is an opportunity for you to attend the FAA Academy where you will find world-class training from the FAA to become a mission critical air traffic controller. So we'd like to thank you all again for being here this today and hope you take an interest in the FAA. And if not the FAA, we certainly hope you take an interest in aviation. Thank you all very much. Good luck and best regards. Thanks, Sadie. Thanks, Glenn. We appreciate the kind words and we are definitely excited about uh, the audience that we have today because we are looking to get some new air, air traffic controllers in our training curriculum very soon. So today we have several key members of the Aviation Development Task Force uh, that will provide information about the ADP program. And this will include the application process, uh, job job qualifications, the technical training requirements, 
and basically what it's like to be an air traffic controller. We will have questions and answers that we will have a questions and answers portion at the end of the briefing. However, feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A chat box or Q&A box, excuse me, uh, located at the bottom of your screen. We don't want you to forget anything as we go through this process. So feel free to, to submit them. And we again, we will have a session allotted at the end that we will uh, cover all questions um, as quickly as possible. So now I'd like to begin sharing about what the federal aviation is. Who are we? Um, the FAA is responsible for maintaining the safest and most efficient airspace in the world. We regulate all aspects of civilian aviation in the United States, as well as adjacent, adjacent international waters, such as air traffic management and airport construction. Our agency was established in 1958, and today the FAA operates under the Department of Transportation in all 50 states and US territories. The agency employs over 47,000 employees nationwide in various occupations, with approximately 70% of our positions being technical in nature. A FAA occupations um, can range from airway transportation system specialists in industry, they're called electronics technicians, engineers, aviation safety inspectors, personnel security specialists, and air traffic control specialists. We also have a non-mission critical occupation that many uh, people in, in the public don't, aren't aware of, such as human resource specialists, management and program analysts, and EEO uh, opportunity, equal employment opportunity professionals such as myself. However, regardless of the position we hold here at FAA, we, we all continue to strive to meet the FAA mission, which is, which is to provide the safe, most efficient airspace system in the world. And that's something we are very proud of. So uh, to talk about the focus for today and while you are, why you are all joining us, the focus for today's session, next slide please. The focus of today's session is to talk to you about our newly development program called the Aviation Development Program, again, ADP. Since ADP's inception in 2018, we have built a solid framework and engaged broad corporate support to provide people with disabilities and specifically targeted disabilities opportunities in mission critical aviation related positions here at FAA, which has been unprecedented. Currently, we are focused on our air traffic control specialist occupations and have our first cadre, I'm proud to say, in training as we speak virtually, but in training at three of our air traffic uh, facility locations across the nation. We are now in our second round of solicitation for candidates, um, hence being with you here today to fill more than 20 positions nationwide to start at 10 locations throughout the country. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Jeff Huber. Jeff will now share with you the locations and more importantly, the types of ATC occupations we are looking to fill. So Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Sadie. And hello, everyone. I hope this day finds you healthy and well. My name is Jeff Hubert, and um, I am the air traffic manager for Oakland Center. I would like to thank you for taking the time to learn about the ADP program and for your interest in the air traffic control uh, career field. When most people think about air traffic control, they usually think about the control tower they may see at their local airport. It is, after all, the most visible symbol of what we do. Within the National Airspace System, which we refer to as the NAS, the air traffic control system component is comprised of many facets. There are air traffic controllers working in facilities around the country, such as flight service stations, control towers, radar approach control facilities, radar en route centers, and air traffic controllers perform an array of functions from giving their pilots as their clearances to directing aircraft on taxiways and runways, 
and uh, separating arriving and departing aircraft at the airport. They also work aircraft that have departed one airport and are on their way to their destination airport. And that is the in route field. And I was an in route controller for 25 years, actually all of it here at Oakland Center. And I'm very familiar with the opportunities that will be available to our ADP graduates in the air traffic system. In a nutshell, the job of an in route controller is to direct the flight of an aircraft that have departed one air airport and guide them safely to their destination airport. The in route center is a very unique uh, environment. As you can imagine, air traffic moves 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all 365 days of the year. To accommodate the system's needs, in route controllers work a variety of schedules uh, made up of day shifts, swing shifts, and mid shifts. This demands a dedicated individual, and the in route controller must be highly detail oriented, energetic, and self motivated. In addition to the air traffic control, or in addition to air traffic control, the Inroot Center allows exposure to additional aviation support activities. ADP participants will have a unique opportunity to look behind the scenes in a field such as automation, quality control, procedural design, technical operations, and training, just to name a few. This diverse environment is one of the reasons that Inroot Centers were chosen as the best facility to implement the ADP program. And currently there are 22 inert centers in throughout the system, and we have opportunities available at 10 of them. The 10 facilities currently available are Boston Center in Nashua, New Hampshire, Memphis Center in Memphis, Tennessee, Seattle Center in Auburn, Washington, Cleveland Center in Oberlin, uh, Oberlin Ohio, Jacksonville Center, Hilliard, Florida, Salt Lake Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, Fort Worth Center in Fort Worth, Texas, Kansas City Center, is in Alathi, Kansas, and Minneapolis Center is in Farmington, uh, Minnesota, and Denver Center is in Longmont, Colo uh, Colorado. So I'd like to thank you again for your interest in the ADP program. I will now turn you over to Doug Lane, who will discuss the ADP's uh, eligibility requirements along with the ADP process. And take it away, Doug, next slide. Thank you, Jeff. And welcome everyone. It's great that you guys are here with this session with us. So I'm Doug Lane. I am the HR director for the Southwest region located in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm going to walk through the ADP process with you. So the ADP process starts with something we call Schedule A Hiring Authority. And what that is, it's a hiring authority that federal agencies have that gives us the ability to select applicants with severe physical, psychiatric, and intellectual disabilities non-competitively, which is different than the competitive process that the general public uses. So for the ADP program, we are using the Schedule A hiring authority exclusively. And we use a handful of hiring authorities in the FAA. And depending on which one you, uh, you are hired under, you come on as a temporary employee, and then you could be in that temporary status for up to two years before you are converted to a career, but that really a career status. And that really depends though on what hiring authority we're using to select you. Next slide, please. So the top three hiring authorities that we tend to use is veterans recruitment authority appointment, 30% or more disabled veterans and people with disabilities and targeted disabilities, which we commonly refer to as Schedule A hiring. So how this works is with Schedule A hiring, if you've ever looked for a job on USA Jobs at, uh, to apply for a position in the federal government, you can apply competitively to an announcement and there's a questionnaire in there that allows you to state that you are eligible for Schedule A hiring. So when that announcement closes and they start the competitive process, applicants that have identified themselves as eligible for Schedule A can be selected non-competitively. That's one part. The other part is actually through a non-competitive process, which the ADP program is. So there's, or there's another job that you just apply for outside of a posting and you send your resume and ask to be considered under ADP, you could be selected that way as well, non-competitively. So who is eligible for this? If you are eligible for the program, you'd have to get a Schedule A letter from your physician or a certified voc rehab counselor that states that you have a severe physical, psychiatric, or intellectual disability and you qualify for the program. And then there's a form that once you are selected for a position called a 256, 
where you self-identify yourself with the disability that you have. Next slide, please. So for the ADP program, in order to be considered eligible, you first have to be eligible to have a Schedule A letter. You must be a US citizen. If you're a male 18 years or older, you must have had to register with Selective Service. And you also have to be under 31 years of age at the time that we put you on the rolls. And the reason for that is air traffic controllers have a mandatory retirement age of 56 years old. And in order to be fully vested in your retirement with the government, you have to have your minimum retirement age, 56, with 25 years of service. So if you count 25 years of service, age 31, that gets you to 56. That's the reason why we don't pick people for air traffic control positions beyond their 30th birthday. So that allows you to be eligible. Now you have to look to see if you're qualified for the position. So in order to be qualified for the position, you have to have three years of progressive responsible work or a bachelor's degree or a combination of, of the two. You also have to be proficient in English. English doesn't have to be your first language, but it has to, you have to be proficient in it. So once you're eligible and qualified, then we would consider you for taking our ATSA test, which is our air traffic skills assessment. And that's another qualifying part of this position. You have to take and pass the ATSA exam. And then after that, you would have to uh, meet all the medical requirements for the job and the background in order to be considered fully qualified for the position. Next, please. So this is just the ADP process overall. It starts with a resume and a Schedule A letter, then the ATSA exam. And we put in here reasonable accommodation. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, what reasonable accommodation is, it's any change to the hiring process, the application process, anything to do with the work that you would, the work environment that would allow a person with a disability who is otherwise qualified for the job to, to be able to do the essential functions of the job. So that's what reasonable accommodation is. And we'll get to more of that in the next slide. Uh, once you do that and you pass the test, we send you a letter that we call a tentative offer letter. Letter, And what we refer to it as, don't quit your day job just yet, because that offer letter allow, tells you that we're considering putting you on our roles and making a selection, but you have to pass all the requirements first. And those requirements are in the next block, which are the clearances. So you'd have to pass a drug test, a background check, and a medical assessment. Once you've passed all of those, we give you the firm offer letter. That's where we're telling you, absolutely, we've hired you and we're looking at a date to have you start. At that point, once you're hired and on roles, you will start a customized training program, which is very unique to the ADP program. And one of my colleagues will actually explain that in greater detail. Once you go through that training, you actually attend our air traffic academy in Oklahoma. That's where all air traffic trainees go to get their training. If you are successful in completing all that, then you become a, a Canada developmental air traffic controller. And once you're a developmental air traffic controller, you will go back to the facility and where you started and you'll actually start working on becoming a fully certified air traffic controller. Next slide, please. So some of this information that I'm gonna talk about in this slide was actually covered in the last slide, but we wanted to ensure that we were very clear on the process to give you a thorough understanding of it. So what you will do, you will, if you're interested in this program, you will build a profile for the ADP program going to this webpage on the slide. And we're gonna have that webpage up at the end of the presentation too. So if you don't have it here, don't worry, we'll give it to you again. When you do that, you build your resume or you uh, build your profile, you will upload a resume and it doesn't matter. We don't care what format it's in, along with your Schedule A letter that shows that you're eligible for Schedule A consideration. Once you do that, you will get an email back stating that we received your information. 
we will have HR specialists go through your information to make sure that you are A, eligible, and B, qualified to move on to the next step. Once we've determined that, you will get an email invitation to take the ATS exam. And again, the ATS is the Air Traffic Skills Assessment exam. You will have 30 days from the time you're told to take the test to schedule and take the exam. You have to pass the exam in order to move on to the next step. And a passing, we don't give scores out to the applicants, so you won't know your score. You'll either know whether you passed or not based on the information that we send you. If you pass, then you will get the tentative offer letter, as I refer to as a don't quit your day job yet, that just says that you, you're doing great so far in the process. The next step is that you have to get a pre-employment medical background and drug screen. Once you pass all that, then you actually get a firm offer letter that says, this is great, we want you, you're on board, everything's good. And then it tells you when and where you're going to report. And then the FAA will match you with a, a person at the facility to help you with your specialized training. So that's really it. That's the program in a nutshell. So I'm gonna hand this off to my colleague, Jennifer Allen Tallman, to go over the actual specifics of the customized training program. Jennifer? So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer Allen Tallman. I'm a manager in uh, air traffic technical training. And you met my boss earlier, that was Glenn Martin. I think he did a great job introducing and telling you about our training uh, here uh, in the FAA. And um, I wanna pick up where Doug left off. And so, so now let's set the stage a little bit. You've passed the ATSA. What does that mean? That means that you have the aptitude to learn and to become a certified air traffic controller. And that's where we began. After you've been, so you passed the ATSA, you passed your security, you passed your medical, and you've received your offer letter. And, and so now it's time to report to the facility. We work closely together with, with Doug's team, and we coordinate to get you into the facility to start your new hire orientation. That lasts about a couple of weeks or so so that we'll make sure we introduce you to the training department, you receive all the training equipment that you need, your background, um, train some background training, uh, ethics, basic tra basics uh, training, employee awareness training, all those basic background things that you need to be a, a regular employee in the FAA. So then we move on to the um, specialized training, which is the air traffic basics training. Air traffic basics training is normally held at the academy, but for those individuals who are participating in the ADP program, you will be receiving your training actually at the facility. The benefits of that is that there is no travel associated with it and you can learn immediately upon your uh, graduation from the, uh, your AT basics class. And uh, the fundamentals class is, is critical. It's the same training that anyone would receive at the academy. And once you're completed that training, you move on to your facility uh, stage training. And that um, stage training where they teach you things like the federal highway system, um, how to use the equipment, uh, how to operate the, the computer equipment and um, and working in the airspace and how things work at the particular facility that you're in. Then uh, after, after you receive that uh, in route certification training, we'll continue some additional training with, with uh, what we call uh, in route um, ghost pilot training. And that involves learning how to be a remote pilot operator so that you can work with the training department to certify, or rather to engage in training with uh, other controllers. Being a ghost pilot allows you, the, the, gives you the background to learn how uh, air traffic control instructions are given, how, how, the, uh, how air traffic, trans, how planes transfer through the system and how all the other, all the other pieces work together. So, it's a, it's a very uh, important piece and it allows you 
uh, a greater understanding of uh, the air traffic process and controlling traffic once, uh, once you become a, a regular into the uh, certification program. And after you've uh, received your certification as a ghost pilot, um, as a remote pilot operator, then we'll give you some shadowing and some um, monitoring positions within the facility where you'll go uh, learn some training about uh, some of the other careers that was mentioned earlier that Jeff had mentioned earlier, my colleague, about the flight data unit, how uh, flight data communication specialists perform their duties, how the traffic management uh, department runs their, runs their, their duties, aerospace and procedures, how weather works and, and working at the uh, central weather service unit, and then uh, so, as well as some other areas of specialization. You'll also learn a, about the quality control and how it's a, how the, what the importance of having a good um, operating system and how our quality system works to ensure that we keep our standards to, to the highest degree level. Once you've learned uh, all that all that's needed at the uh, the Enroot facility, that that basic overview, you'll continue to work at the facility for a period of time, the year whereupon you're evaluated um, for all the things that you've learned, and a determination is made by the uh, the facility manager as to whether or not you are a good, in fact, a good candidate to to continue with the FAA, whereupon you're selected and you're sent to the academy to learn uh, the fundamentals, additional fundamentals of running in route air traffic. This is a, a four month course uh, that is taught at the academy and it gives you a greater understanding of how to run traffic at the in route facilities. Being an air traffic controller involves a lot of training. It is, uh, it's a highly, highly rewarding career and, but it does involve quite a bit of training, but it's, it's it's the kind of foundation that you'll need to get you uh, to a place where you can run traffic easily and, and, and rewarding and, and contribute generously to the system. And with that, I will hand it over to Sadie. Take it away. Hi, Jennifer. Actually, I'm gonna take it from here for some questions, but thank you all for sharing your expertise and for discussing the ADP program. So at this time, we've allowed it a couple of minutes um, just for some audience questions. So we want you to be proactive and to engage in the process here. So if you're joining us on Zoom, please submit your question in the Q&A box. If you're watching this live online, please submit your questions by commenting on the platform post. We also received some questions ahead of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and start by asking our great qualified panelists some questions that were presented to us. And hopefully these will answer some of your questions that you may have. So Doug, I'm gonna start with you. How long does the ADP process take from application to possible onboarding? It varies, however, it's usually about four to five months is usually the average once we start the program, and then it depends on once you're eligible, considered eligible and qualified, and we schedule you for the ATSA, we actually have to schedule applicants in groups. So it's not immediate. So we have to wait until we get a group. So there's some time in there. And then you have 30 days once you get, once you get the letter to schedule to um, schedule it and take it. And then we have to wait for the results. So probably four to five months on the average through beginning to where we're gonna actually put you on. Okay, thank you. I have another question that may tie in with that. Where do I start the application for the ATSA? So application for, for the ATSA, you will get a notification for uh, once you are eligible and qualified, you'll get a notification from us that says, here's the information to sign up for the ATSA. And a question we get on the ATSA is, do we have study material? And the FAA does not have study material. However, there is study material out online if you'd like to uh, use it. 
Now I will, I need to make sure we're very clear. The FAA is not endorsing any specific type of training material. We don't have it. My understanding is there is good training material online, but it's not affiliated at all with the FAA whatsoever. And uh, when you also apply for the FAA or the ATSA, you will get a sample test questions that you can study from as well. Okay. So I have another question. I'm going to give this one to Jeff, no, to Jennifer, to Jennifer. How many candidates attend the FAA Academy at one time and how long does the Academy last? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, and it depends on uh, what we're asking. Well, when for the basics, the air traffic basics, the, the course lasts five weeks and all the classes, just as yours is, is a virtual class for the air traffic basics. So, uh, even though you'll be attending the class, uh, the air traffic basics class in a group of, with a group of your fellow ADP candidates at your facilities, the other individuals will be taking them individually from different locations, uh, but it will be coming from or through the, delivered through the academy. So uh, for, the, for the basics class, it's a five week period. If you go to the, once you've gone into the initial in route training, that lasts approximately four months. After you've completed the in route training, then you'll proceed back to the facility where you begin your classroom training, followed by your on the job training for the various positions. There are a number of positions throughout and, and Jeff can give you uh, more details on all the positions that are in the facility. But again, uh, your basic training uh, from, from the very beginning to the end can last as much as three to four years. Is that correct, Jeff? Sorry, let me come off mute. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, it definitely varies um, by facility, uh, how many developmentals and the type of facility. Uh, typically in the in-route environment, it's running roughly uh, two, two to three years usually. Once you, once you enter, once you get into the facility and you start your qualification training. Okay, thank you both. So I have another live question here. Are particular MOS AFSC rating specialists predominantly successful with these opportunities? I'm not certain who this question should be directed to, but I'm gonna give it a try with Jennifer. <laughs> I like that, I like that, get that, quick, that big shock value. Well, I'm 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 not particularly um, um, sure what the question is. However, I'll take a stab at it too. When we're talking about MOS, I, I'm assuming we're talking military operating, uh, uh, military operating code specialty, and um, I'm I'm struggling to remember what those what those courts are. But for uh, the military and like in the Air Force, they have and what they call an Air Force specialty code. And um, if you're if it's for an air traffic control, there are some hiring uh, mapping that does correlate to the air traffic control field in the FAA. Uh, Jeff, can you expand in? Do you have any uh, additional information on that? Please chime in. <laughs> So I, I am also not sure, and I don't know if they can if if they can type in. I was looking further down and see. Oh, there's several questions. Um, yeah, military operate occupational specialties. Right. So in the in route centers, we do have a military operations specialist um, that is more of uh, it used to be tied to the traffic management unit. Now it's pretty much a standalone. It's it's a um, support specialist position. Uh, but I mean, having that knowledge um, would, would definitely any any air traffic knowledge. If you're a forward controller, if you're, you know, uh, experience with scheduling uh, MOAs, if you were doing that in in either the probably one of the, the probably the Navy or the Air Force branches, any any of that that you bring to the job is going to give you a greater familiarity, um, and, and you know, it's it's going to give you a, a head start because you'll just, you'll understand because you will get mowed down by acronyms as, as, as these were and every agency's, you know, MOS is slightly different. So, um, but ho hopefully that helped. So, so Jeff and, and Jennifer and team, um, great questions. Just keep in mind uh, for uh, the individual that asked that question and for all of the audience, we will have um, 
the IOUs to take back. So if we we'll look into that one and, and if you want additional information, we can provide it. But one other thing I wanted to add uh, before we move on, we will have some frequently asked questions uh, subsequent to this session uh, posted on the ADP website. Um, so more to come with that, but I wanted to put that out there just so you know that we, we don't want to not answer your questions, but we want to ensure that we give you the correct information. Thank you, Sadie. Joyce? Yes. Oh, thank you, Sadie. So I have a lot of where do I start to the application for the ATSA and where can I submit my resume and prepare for the ATSA test? I believe that will go to you, Doug. <laughs> it would. So we're going to put up later in this program after the Q&A, the website that you will go to to apply for it. And you'll just click on that link. It'll take you to a system we use called Recruiter Box. It'll have you create a profile. You'll upload your resume. You will also put your Schedule A letter there. And I will say that if you have your resume ready and you want to apply for the program and you don't have your Schedule A letter, you can still submit the resume without the Schedule A letter. However, we will have to have the Schedule A letter prior to deeming you eligible and qualified. So, but you don't have to wait for it if, if there's a delay in that. We'll just, we will reach out to you and say, hey, we need your Schedule A letter. Okay. So once we've determined that you're eligible and qualified, we will send you an email that tells you where to sign up to take the ATSA and that you have 30 days. So again, there's material online that's not affiliate, affiliated in any way with the FAA, but you're more than welcome to use it. You can reach out to any air traffic, if you know any air traffic controllers to see what's on the test. I personally don't even know what's on the test. I, I didn't start as an air traffic controller, but that's how that program works. That's how it will work. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, since I have you here, <laughs> Is there already a posting up on USA Jobs for us to apply? Or how would someone apply for this position? So this is a very unique position with the ADP program. So we do not currently have a posting up for air traffic control trainees for the general public. So right now, this is the only way for if someone's scheduled for Schedule A to be considered for the program, this is the only way to become an air traffic controller non-competitively at this time. Okay, and since I have you, I'm gonna ask you one more question. Okay. Are there any conditions that are automatic disqualifiers? Yeah, there are some medical conditions that are automatic disqualifiers, but what we tell all the applicants is everyone, it's all looked at at a case-by-case -case basis. So don't self-select out. You can apply for the program. And if there's something that's very specific, our medical staff would get with you and explain to you um, why you, there's a reason medically why you wouldn't be eligible for the program. And I will say, and I guess like, I will say like, for instance, um, blindness or deafness, if you were legally blind, probably more than likely you would not be medically qualified for the program. That's just an example, but I, I would rather have someone apply and, and not self-select out and let someone medically who, who has that background tell them why. Doug, if I can just add on to that, because I think it's important and you, you raise a good point that I think the audience should know about. And that's if in fact, you know, you're hesitant, please, as Doug shared, apply. Because one of the other things that we have uh, within this program is the applicants who actually uh, upload their resumes as well as their Schedule A letter we keep them in a repository for other positions that that you may be suitable for within the FAA. So take advantage of this process. We absolutely want to see you try to be an air traffic controller if that is what your, your passion is uh, going to be to strive for. But we also want to encourage you apply. But, I mean, and I use that word loosely because it's not an application process. We are using direct hire, as Doug mentioned. But please submit your resumes through the process that we have in place that will be on the website here shortly. Thank you, Sadie. I have one, I have a couple more questions, but at the end of training, will applicants be able to move locations and work in a tower 
other than the 10 pilot locations? Which one of you guys can answer that? I, I'm not air traffic controller, but we have worked this out through the ADP program. If in fact you are qualified and do become a candidate uh, for the 10 locations, you obviously will go through the process. Uh, but if in fact that you decide that you want to try a tower option and are familiar with the FAA facilities, um, at that time, you are more than uh, capable of applying to any open bids that we have on USA jobs for those positions or use an internal process that we have to, to uh, um, move individuals from one location to, to the other. However, that's with the caveat that if you decide to do that, you will be uh, removed from the aviation development program and be in the competitive process as someone who actually applied to a general public announcement. Uh, that's, of course, if you're in the program, if you decide that you, you know, the center option is not for you right off the bat, then you actually would need to apply through the USA jobs options when the uh, advertisements come out uh, periodically throughout the year. Thank you, Sadie. You bet. Doug, I hate to bother you again. <laughs> Any additional information on Schedule A letter, what or who would issue this letter? So there is information. And if you go into, uh, go to opm.gov, which is the Office of Personnel Man Management, and all you have to do is type in Schedule A Hiring Authority. They actually have sample letters for your physician or your certified vocational rehab counselor to complete. Most physicians, for sure, certified rehab counselors are very familiar with the Schedule A hiring authority, and most physicians are as well. And you, you can provide a sample to your doctor, and really it has to be on their letterhead stating that you're an applicant that is a, a person that's considered having a severe physical, psychiatric, or intellectual disability, and that you would qualify under Schedule A. We don't need to know what the disability is. In fact, we prefer that we don't. It just needs a letter from a certified rehab counselor or a physician that states that you would qualify for the program. So sample letters are at opm.gov. Thank you, Doug. Jeff, this question is for you. Can you um, let us know what is it like to be an air traffic controller? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, obviously, I thought being an air traffic controller is a great job. Um, <laughs> you, but uh, you know, when you when you just coming in and training, and uh, when you're just checked out, the air traffic field offers you a lot of autonomy. Uh, autonomy. You work by you know a lot of times by yourself at a sector or a position, but you're still part of of this greater system, and you know, the whole system is designed to, to obviously ensure safety and maximize efficiency. Um, an analogy that, that, that I used, and, and when, so when I was in college, I was a cook at a restaurant and, um, you know, working on the, on the line with, with the other chefs that were there. Um, and for those of you are familiar in short orders is the same thing. There's, there's a lot of periods of, of slowness before, and then you, you just get a wave of the dinner rush comes in or the lunch rush and, and air traffic moves the same way. Excuse me. <coughs> um, all the airlines want to land and depart at the same time. So it, it produces really intense rushes. So in that it's, it's uh, similar. Another similar, um, to, to cooking is the pressure to get each order cooked correctly, um, you know, on time and, and when the rest of the people, you know, if, if it's a table of four, uh, everything together. And that's the same thing as, as getting aircraft through your, through your sector to their destination airport or, or just through your sector on to, to their, to their next sector, because we work a string of sectors. Um, the, the last piece is if, if you, have, are familiar with the expediter position in a kitchen, they're the person in the center and they're kind of directing the different uh, parts of the meals. And, and that is actually for the sequencing sectors, very, very similar. Uh, you take all these aircraft from all these different positions and you put them in a line so they can all land uh, safely and orderly. So, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities there and it's, it's 
different enough every single day, even though, you know, United one departs every day, but, you know, if he's 30 seconds late or an hour, you know, it makes it different every day. So it's fun. It's a very enjoyable job. Thank you, Jeff. That's a great analogy of an air traffic controller. So I have another question. Um, can we request Facebook Live or Zoom presentations be made for transitioning veteran groups we are associated with? Sadie, you want to try that one? Sorry about that. I was having technical difficulties. So not sure if I'm going to answer this right. So if I, if I don't, whoever asked the question, please follow up in, in the Q&A box. Uh, but as for the live stream and uh, everything that you just mentioned in that, for this session in particular, it is actually going to be placed on our website um, for, for future use to refer to um, in, in at a later date, if you are wanting to refer back to it. So yes, it, it is recorded. It will be placed on our website. Um, but if you're asking outside of this actual program and are asking for a specific training, um, you know, please add more information in the uh, Q&A section and we'll try and answer that as well. Thank you, Sadie. Sure. So I have another ATSA question. What are some of the topics on the ATSA? And this is a two-part question. Will chosen applicants be able to choose one of the 10 locations? That's a real good one. Okay. So I'm going to hit that the second part of that question first. So if you want to apply, you can apply from one to 10 of the facilities. It doesn't matter which one you apply for, and you can, can be considered for all 10 if you are willing to move. Now keep in mind, moving to that facility that will be on your own dime. We're, we don't pay for relocation for any air traffic controllers moving to the facility. So just keep that in mind, but you can apply for all 10. So with the ATSA, depending on how well you do, if you score well and there, and while I said there's not, it's a passing score, you don't know the score. Um, in fact, most of the people on the team don't know the score, but we do have scores. So in the background, if more than one applicant passes the ATSA for a particular facility, we will use score order to determine which one gets selected first and, and, and next. And then the first part, would you please repeat the first part of that question? Sure. Parts of the ATSA, was that? Parts of the, some of the topics or parts, some of the topics in the ATSA. There are part, I'm not gonna be very good at that. I, as I said earlier, I, I've never, I haven't taken the ATSA, so I'm, I'm at a disadvantage here. There are time parts, there are logic parts, there are mathematical parts, uh, there are uh, air traffic parts of like collisions, you know, trying to avoid um, accidents. And so each part is segmented and timed for that particular part. So, but I, I know I'm not being very helpful as far as being more specific, but that's really all I know about the ad, so to be honest. So while you are talking about that, I think would be of, of a good uh, point to share with the audience of, uh, you mentioned reasonable accommodations um, in the application process. Uh, one of the things to point out is if in fact that you do get that, your, your tentative offer letter and our are scheduled to take an ATSA, what would happen if someone would need special requirements to take the Okay, test? yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. So if you're an applicant with a disability that would need some type of reasonable accommodation for the test part, which we do have applicants that actually need that, once you get the email that tells you to schedule your ATSA, you have 30 days to schedule, in the, in the body of the email, it will explain the process of requesting reasonable accommodation. And so what you will be doing, you will actually be reaching out to, I believe, Joyce Hunter initially, who, um, who will set it up with a group of us to determine what type of accommodation you need to take the test. And on that vein that we were talking about earlier about they're all, the segments are, are timed and, and broken out into segments. 
if for instance, and we've had this re requested as an example, if you, if based on your disability, you would need additional time, there are parts of the test where you actually could have extra time because they're not specifically looking for time to reaction. Now, the, on the flip side of that, there are parts of the test that are there are absolutely designed for reaction time. So in that particular case, we would not be able to offer additional time for that particular part of the test. But we've had applicants that have applied that have requested accommodation to, for instance, to make sure if you're in a wheelchair, to make sure the facility that you go to is handicap accessible, to make sure that if you can't use a standard keyboard, that another form of um, a tool for you to use that you're familiar with is available, that you can take the test that way. So we do offer a wide variety of options for reasonable accommodation. The one thing to keep in mind that if just because you request it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna give you that exact accommodation, but we will do whatever we possibly can to accommodate you so at least you'd be able to take the test. That's a good one. Thank you, Doug. Since I have you, I'm going to throw a double question at you. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's what I'm here for. So are there any pay rate ranges for this position? That's part one. And then how do I know if I'm qualified? Okay. So, and, and that's a great question. In fact, I'm surprised it took this long to ask about pay. Usually that's a, a top one. So currently the base pay for this job is $24,425 annually. Now, and make sure before you say, well, that's too low. I want to clarify that. The reason I said currently is because federal pay tends to do incremental increases annually. So this was the last annual increase as of uh, 2020. So it would start out at 24,425 base pay. Then depending on what facility you go to, we have something called locality pay. And that's additional pay based on the part of the country that you work, work in. And locality pay is for, tends to be for places that are more, tend to be more um, higher cost of living. So in this program of the 10 facilities, the locality pay is between around like 15% to 28%. So what that means, it's 24,425 and then plus an additional 15 to 28%, depending on what part of the country you're gonna be in to get your salary. So for Fort Worth, the, the starting salary for the ADP program trainee job is like 30,500 and some odd dollars. And that's for the duration of the time that you're in the training that Jennifer discussed, that training program that's about eight to 12 months. Then you go to the academy, you'll get different locality pay at that time. And then once you're, you pass the, the academy in Oklahoma and that you become a developmental air traffic control trainee, then when you, whenever you go back to your facility, that salary increases as well. And it's, again, it's different based on the facility and the location, but you're looking at like for Texas, for instance. So if you start out at 30,500 and X dollars, then by the time you end up going back to the facility as a developmental trained um, air traffic control trainee, your salary jumps up to like the mid 40 range. So there's, it's a significant, um, bump in pay. It's, it's uh, low to mid 40s. I don't have that exactly. But, but that's what would happen. And then you get incremental steps throughout your career. So the one thing that's great about this program is this gives people the ability that may not be selected for a competitive posting for air traffic controls to get a job in air traffic. And a lot of our jobs in air traffic are six figure salaries. So that's not out of the question for an applicant starting in this program to work their way up through their career to have, a, you know, to end with a six figure salary. Thank you, Doug. So I have one more question and I'm gonna pass this to you, Sadie, to answer and for you to close the amazing program. So is the training done in the same facility where an individual is going to work? And thank you all. Thanks, Joyce, and a, a good way to close it out. Um, 
Yeah, the training itself, um, just keep in mind when you are, per, per Doug's um, information he shared today, when you actually submit your, your um, application or your resume to the website, you will need to identify which locations you actually um, would like to be considered for. But yes, the training itself, initial training for that first appointment prior to going to the academy, uh, for the additional training will be at the location that you actually were selected for. In addition to that, uh, once you are hopefully successful at the FAA Academy in Oklahoma City, um, you will return to that location. So that is something else that's unique to this program uh, for an air traffic control specialist position. Um, I know we have several questions still in the uh, Q&A section. Please know that we will uh, do our due diligence to get you responses. Um, we do have information from your registration to send, send you answers back, but also know that we're gonna have a frequently asked questions on our website. Uh, this does conclude our, our uh, session today. Thank you everyone so much for attending. And I hope you found this information session inspiring and, and hopes to see your application in our process. So if you would like to be a part of the ADP program or consider, please go to our, our website at www.faa.gov slash go slash ADP and follow the online instructions to submit your candidate profile. Thanks again, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Washington out.